first, uh, hello everybody. Uh, I'm the global CTO for governments and part of that work is uh, ensuring that uh, we are using the best resources at the best place. And so you can imagine that uh, you can, uh, governments have embassies that are more at the edge and they have uh, central systems in the in the country. So we have many use cases where uh, you need to be sure that you operate uh, uh, on the best place with the best uh, uh, outcomes. Um, so I wanted to do that presentation that is not specifically about one IBM product, even though I uh, I touch on several uh, uh, products, but it's more about uh, how do you uh, get the best from cognitive and hybrid cloud across uh, all the landscape of your enterprise. So what we have seen uh, in terms of generation of computing is the evolution from mainframe to uh, public cloud uh, going through client server, internet and mobile and now, uh, and there was a good example in the previous presentation with the wind farm and uh, the wind turbines. These are edge devices, in fact, and uh, the, the numbers are no more millions, it's billions of devices that we are seeing coming to the edge. The, there's a, 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 the data that these devices will produce will be massive and it will be exabyte or uh, petabytes or exabytes, the, uh, those, uh, that growth of uh, data cannot be handled as uh, it is today on central systems. So you, you have to find ways to uh, scale and uh, make sure that you're getting the insights uh, from the best, better place and reduce the uh, bandwidth, energy and latency issues. The, the, these are real issues and I'll show you later uh, some example of machine learning that uh, uh, stunned, really stunned me when I saw the figures about the car carbon footprint that they are impacting. So we really need to be uh, to make those decisions closer to the place where the information is created. Uh, as an example, I see now machine learning on appliances at home, and uh, uh, I don't think we should send the data back to central systems, even though we can send some uh, uh, the crux of the learning, you know, to the uh, to the central systems when necessary and when compatible with GDPR. So. Uh, the uh, workload deployment today it's 90% uh, of the workloads are either internally on mainframe private cloud and I consider the mainframe to be a private cloud. Uh, it, it has this virtualization for years, uh, uh, but now we're extending that uh, through the multi access edge computing to edge devices, gateways, uh, uh, could be the cars, could be uh, in a factory, all the machines that you want to control the status and if, if some problem is going to happen. And you want the coherent management of all of those uh, workloads. And Gartner states that very soon, and that's 2025, 75% uh, of the workloads will be on edge devices. So we have to anticipate uh, that progression and make sure that we have everything that enable the control end to end and life cycle on what is being deployed to the edge. So the uh, for that we've uh, created the, the uh, IBM Edge Application Manager, but you see the scale when you're uh, 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 on uh, on the network edge it's thousands of clusters, then you have using the 5G or the either private or public, you can expect to have millions of clusters and then billions of devices. And uh, the size of a, a Docker container 
is too big for most of the edge devices. So uh, uh, to control that, they still use the OCI, which is the standard for the Open Container Initiative, but it's a more smaller footprint that you can de deploy easily to the edge and still control the workloads. The, if you create those workloads centrally, you can define and, and ensure that the code is certified and protected and then that you deliver to all of those billion of devices and the ones that need these workloads that you devise something that is uh, uh, secure and does the uh, in perform the insight that you are needed to to get the information back or the insight back to the central part of your business so uh, edge is just an extension of hybrid computing but it uh, so all what we design for the edge is container based or uh, and it's compatible with all of this uh, architecture that we started from the hybrid computing with the private cloud or the public cloud extending to the netro uh, network and the metro edge uh, with Kubernetes and then uh, towards also the clusters that could be within a factory, uh, within a branch, within uh, ships, within planes, and then to the edge devices, which could be uh, an appliance at home, like a, a personal scale or a machine in a factory or a car or a wind turbine. So we, you need a continuity and to manage that and to control and ensure that all the issues are reported and that the security is managed end to end that you have uh, now this uh, uh, confidential computing as an example. We have clients that want to protect the data in use from being accessed uh, that all is available end to end uh, from the central part of your network to the edge. Um, what, um, as the edge is producing tons of data, huge, uh, massive amounts of data, we need a different approach to uh, creating those models and having these cognitive uh, models being created. And so what we, we have created is a, federated machine learning where you can uh, have the uh, uh, data and the learning being processed dis uh, in a distributed fashion. And then you consolidate, not the data, but you consolidate the models and you consolidate the, the learnings and you can process and aggregate and then redistribute uh, what has been learned from uh, the edge environment. So it's, uh, no more one, uh, uh, the, the choice needs to be made based on the non-functional requirements. Uh, do I need to protect my data on the edge and only have some uh, synthesized information being used for the learning or uh, do I need the full information for creating a, a model? And that's what cognitive architects can help you model and deliver in your landscape. So uh, which use case do we see? We see process optimization uh, use cases like in factories. I want to make sure that my supply chain is uh, optimized, uh, situational awareness, and uh, that could be safety in plants or factory, uh, human machine collaboration, uh, like g going into a, a warehouse and uh, selecting the right uh, spare parts to deliver to uh, for uh, some uh, orders or autonomous ships. Uh, uh, so all of that is use cases that now include the uh, uh, edge. And you may have seen uh, the Mayflower uh, project, which is the autonomous ship from IBM. Uh, that can cross the Atlantic just by uh, uh, driving itself in an autonomous fashion. So uh, we can extend uh, 
the edge and the cognitive use cases to many uh, different type of uh, uh, of use cases, and it's just the beginning of that uh, 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 that approach. So, cognitive is expanding everywhere and becoming pervasive. Uh, whether it's from signal comprehension, and currently I'm personally involved in a project where uh, we want to detect uh, uh, newborn infants, uh, hypoxia, you know, babies that when they are delivered get less oxygen. And you have six hours to react with an EEG, and you have to interpret that EEG to understand if the baby uh, was impacted by a lack of oxygen because then the treatment, you have six hours to start a treatment, which is put the baby in hypothermia at 33 degrees, but this is painful for the baby, so you have to sedate the baby so, and uh, uh, put, it in, uh, put him in uh, hypothermia for two or three days. So we, we do this signal comprehension to help the doctors react within the six hours uh, that you have to start the treatment. Le le learning and reasoning is coming where more uh, uh, sense is being made from the information. So he, instead of having raw classification, you need to understand the situation and give you advice. And so we see more and more symbolic uh, uh, artificial intelligence complementing the, the machine learning part. So what is my next best next best action what should i do what's the uh, help me to plan the future and we have scenario planning uh, uh, advisor this is a, a product that we're using for financial decisions or even uh, uh, defense decisions and then you have a lot happening with interaction uh, on the enablers i've uh, there's uh, i have seen several uh, startups doing machine learning on one euro processors. So this, you have cheap processors and the machine learning is not sent back to the central side. It's performing the machine itself. So they can understand that some uh, variation has happened in the sensor environment uh, where it's been placed. We're going for more of deep and surprise learning where we don't need people in front of the models to do the, the annotations because you don't want the experts in the domain uh, not to work on their current job, just to do labeling of uh, information for learning. Uh, there's more and more brain and spread, uh, neurosymbolic AI, and uh, there's also a, a new hardware coming with that. And so it's less that more insights about the data. Uh, you know, when it, children sees an image of a car, he immediately recognized the car and he had not to do uh, a, a long uh, learning phase to, the, to do this recognition. You know, there are things that humans can do that the machine can still not do, but we're going towards there. And the data source are uh, expanding and the edge devices are uh, giving us more and more data for that. Uh, and in the future, we can expect more reasoning uh, with uh, uh, autonomy, with some moral reasoning coming too. So an example of a cognitive cycle with a visual model training on the edge, then we compile it, we containerize it, we push it to a and then we publish it to the IBM Edge application manager, which will deliver it to the devices. So it can, for example, for autonomous car or for machines in, uh, in factories to apply the new models, you know, re recognizing defects in parts that are being produced. And so you can imagine that the, the, the parts can change because uh, if you're a closed manufacturer, the model change uh, at each uh, season of uh, fashion. So that's uh, a, 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 this life cycle has to be controlled, secured, and ensure that what you're pushing to the device as a model is genuinely the same that you have created, that nobody has 
fiddle with it and that you have control of the security and so that on the edge you need to ensure that uh, it's certified uh, workloads that you are running. So the security aspects are quite important too with the, uh, this life cycle. I'm currently involved in the Send Senelec, which is the European Standards Body. Uh, I'm leading the other group on sustainable AI. And uh, one uh, report that the uh, article that stunned me is the article that I mentioned here. The training uh, of a transformer uh, natural language processing model with 213 million parameters consumes 320 tons of carbon dioxide. So it's the equivalent of six big US cars, including the fuel from manufacturing to end of life, just for training a natural process, uh, language processing uh, model. And this model is not the latest. The latest does not have 213 million parameters. It's billions, it's around 6 billion parameters. So you can imagine the carbon footprint of the training of such a model. So we need to find new connective and machine learning approaches that reduce that carbon footprint. How can we do a better processing, a better learning that uh, makes AI sustainable and uh, usable by everybody and in the future? And how do uh, do, have, do we have a better machine performance while uh, controlling this footprint and controlling this consumption of resources. So uh, we have to look at where the energy is consumed by uh, artificial intelligence from the acquisition to the data transfer because the more data you're transferring, the more resources you're consuming, all of the clean uh, cleansing, the modeling and the sense making. So do we need those uh, GPUs uh, to uh, do those machine learnings? Do we need those uh, hundreds of clusters just to recognize a penguin? You know, uh, our brain can do the same type of work with only 20 watts. So why would we need uh, uh, kilowatts or megawatts just to do uh, artificial intelligence? So, uh, and uh, interestingly, uh, the brain can work with lower precision. Uh, the, uh, if you have followed what is being done with uh, artificial retinas, with only 128 pixels, black and white pixels, uh, that they insert at the back of the eye, they could get humans to start recognizing that were blind before, that had a retina problem, start seeing again only with 128 pixels, black and white. So the, if the brain is able to do that work with fewer information and lower precision, can't we do the same thing? And H has unique attributes for the sustainable AI. First, you were, we are decentralizing the processing power. If we can put uh, the intelligence in the sensor and send on back only the insights, what has been learned. So instead of sending thousands of events, only send the, uh, uh, the substance of the, what has been happening, you know, just uh, to reduce the, that the data transfer and that uh, processing power consuming. The distributed cloud means that you can push to the edge uh, the, the intelligence that you uh, you can be closer to where the information is useful. And we have some cases where the edge can be disconnected. You cannot expect that uh, what you are doing on the edge, particularly in mobile environment, in cars, if you're a geologist and you're moving across the country and you're somewhere 
uh, in a remote area, you can ex expect to have a good connectivity always. So you need some offline reliability to be to make sure that you can process all the events while the information is being produced. So it's continuous operations uh, and uh, consumption of the energy closer to where it's being produced. Uh, on federated learning, now part of uh, uh, IBM Cloud Pack for Data, you can uh, start uh, playing with the distributed and federated learning. So it, not only it's energy efficient, uh, but it's a trusted approach. And we had cases with banks that have branches in different countries uh, because of the data regulations, they cannot send the data to a central uh, headquarter to be processed because they would uh, breach some <clears throat> regulations. But then uh, some machine learning is performed on the data and provided that this machine learning cannot be reversed uh, uh, to the original data. So you have to take some uh, uh, controls, you know, to ensure that and to, uh, then you can consolidate the models centrally from what has been learned uh, in the distributed fashion. So you no more uh, show, uh, exposing private data and uh, you're uh, reducing the network consumption and the time in transit. Uh, and you have a better control in terms of government of the end-to-end -end picture and uh, of the end-to-end -end cycle of the information. Uh, that, uh, we, I got several cases of banks looking at that, but also other industries. And you can imagine that you can do that also with technical uh, type of data. So uh, we are creating uh, efficient algorithm for sustainable AI. We are, uh, our IBM research is creating some new compression techniques. Uh, uh, we're working with the MIT on the reduction of the carbon footprint of the artificial intelligence. I'm personally involved with a uh, researcher in uh, the Côte d'Azur University, where close to where I live, on binaurized neural network, where you replace, uh, for example, pixels in an image by plus one and minus one. So instead of having grayscale, you only have two values. And then you, you, you teach the machine to recognize patterns. And in fact, for recognizing figures on car plates with less information, it's even better with only plus one and minus one, better than the at least uh, standard uh, neural network. So you have less information, but you're better because you're focusing on what needs to be recognized, like the patterns, and uh, and you can then use uh, reduced precision hardware uh, to implement that. Uh, and then there's also why feeding the machines with uh, uh, huge amounts of data to learn while you can do transfer learning using, for example, if you're already recognizing ovals and squares in, in, a, in a domain, you can recognize fields or you can recognize boxes. So you can do some transfer learning and there's a lot happening on transfer data, uh, uh, small data. Um, Problems. Yeah. What's happening? Sorry, I had an. Well, I have a problem. Hello. The PowerPoint. PowerPoint. I think I have to kill PowerPoint. And restart. It started, it's a restart. I think you should restart uh, it. Uh, 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 so PowerPoint. Uh, okay, so let me switch very quickly. 
Really? So hardware is also new hardware is also coming and some of that new hardware should also be available not only on uh, on power machines or on x86 but some of this hardware uh, should be available on mainframes uh, i have no firm dates but uh, uh, stay tuned uh, you'll see some evolutions uh, of uh, hardware that are interesting for artificial intelligence. Uh, as an example, we're creating uh, reduced precision hardware for artificial intelligence. Uh, Mark, we don't see your presentation. Ah, okay. We don't see it. Yeah, have to, I guess, share again. Now okay. it's start. Now it's. Yeah, now in presentation mode, please, and then. Yeah, do you see my. Perfect. Now you're. Yeah, okay. Because I killed yeah, okay. point, I lost the. <laughs> no, no, no problem. It's okay. Okay. You. So, uh, uh, this one I have done already. So, uh, the reduced precision hardware uh, is something that's interesting. You need also to have the software layer that goes with it. But uh, uh, we're now, instead of going for uh, floating point precision, you know, to compute the matrices in machine learning and vector matrices co computation, we're uh, doing four bit only computation. True enough is something that existed before that it's a spiking network. And we see more and more approximate architecture computing and in memory computation. So instead of going through the CPU, uh, machine learning is a lot about multiplying matrices and vectors. And once you have learned that, you can have an uh, uh, analog AI cores where you can do that computation directly in memory. So you don't need to flow through the processor to do that. And uh, the, uh, the ultra low precision, uh, there are some articles uh, uh, on IBM website about uh, that, uh, and it's uh, seven times more efficient than uh, uh, the current systems, and you're cutting energy and cost. And because you have smaller precision hardware that consume less power, you can put that on edge devices also. Spiking neural networks, it, it really works, but it has not gotten uh, uh, traction today. Maybe because it's another paradigm for programming this. Uh, in memory computing, that's uh, uh, something that should be available some, soon. And uh, also some exploratory memory that consume less and that where you can store more in, in uh, 3D type of arrangements of the memory. So, uh, one important part of getting the edge connected to the headquarters and the private cloud or the mainframe is to ensure that you have an end-to-end -end security approach because you don't want to the edge to be a backdoor for hackers to uh, send a person back wrong information about something that's happening or to uh, there are some cases of attacks on edge devices uh, for recently that have been done by government hackers to so it's a new type of attacks that are occurring to uh, try to impact uh, uh, an enterprise or an organization by accessing accessing what's being delivered at the edge. So you really have to look at the edge not being as a separate uh, uh, security concern, but as, a, uh, as an extension of the security concern that you had previously. And you have to be sure that uh, uh, you integrate the edge now in your end-to-end uh, -end security architecture. So, uh, but one way of controlling that, uh, as I mentioned previously, is that we are endeavoring uh, uh, the workloads to the edge devices 
as containers, not Docker containers, which are too big, but those OCI containers. And, and they, they still need to be controlled to be uh, under a confidential computing type of approach to make sure that everything is safe and protected and uh, is not a, a breach on uh, for cyber security. So we have a lot of products that cover uh, the end-to-end -end type of architecture, including uh, what is coming with 5G and the endpoints and the management of the uh, uh, those endpoints. Uh, I, I'm, I'd rather have other <laughs> uh, specialists than me uh, go through the detail of these architectures, but you can get advice on how to uh, manage those 5G and edge components if you have to integrate them to your end-to-end -end hybrid cloud architecture. So, an action guide. Well, now that we have devices and edge, make sure that the power, meaning the processing power, the workloads that you are delivering uh, are also uh, being operated locally on the devices. Use the edge as much as possible when it's meaningful to use the edge. And send, instead of saying, sending back the raw data to the central site, send the insights from those edges. Make sure that the, the data that which is collected uh, is curated on the edge and as much as possible uh, control at the edge and fix so that you're not sending more uh, trouble data to the central pipe. And start thinking about bringing the apps to the edge. There's more and more use cases coming. Gartner said that 75% of the workloads will now be on the edge. Think about the use, the potential use case in your industry uh, to run those uh, applications on the edge. Which part of what you're doing while controlling the security and the data privacy can be sent to the edge and how can you do this confidential computing on the edge and still uh, uh, have a consistent uh, approach to your processes from an end-to-end -end, uh, 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 view. Being on the edge allows you to act in real time, to react locally. If some, there's some trouble in a rotating machine in a factory, you can fix it. If there's some trouble in an autonomous device, then you can fix it on the edge. So how much can you do by acting on real time at the edge? Can the, you can think also uh, of the edge for insurance companies where you have your telephone, an accident has occurred, and you can uh, take pictures and analyze the damages from your mobile phone. So, and if you are not doing, thinking about these use, those use cases, be sure that your competition will start looking at uh, those use cases. Uh, you need to think about the advantage, the business advantage, and uh, differentiating uh, in, by providing insights to uh, your ecosystem, you know, whether it's your clients, your employees, your partners, uh, make sure you have a control and that it's not doing going to the edge for being on the edge. Uh, make sure it's consistent you, with your end-to-end -end process approach uh, and look at the, the person as how is that person, can that person uh, be in a disconnected mode so that I need to have some processing power for that person on the edge or do I need that information easy? Is there a reason for me to process that information centrally? So make sure to have these uh, design sessions about where the best location for processing your information needs to be. But uh, uh, look at the edge of, as a, a new way of differentiating. And uh, also with 5G coming, there's more speed coming to the edge. Uh, I live near Monaco. The firemen in Monaco, they're using the 5G with drones to control if there's a fire that is uh, uh, 
signal. They send a drone and with 5G, they're able to do a complete control of the situation before uh, they send emergency vehicles and people or while they're sending. So they get uh, uh, information uh, on the situation. And what they say is that they uh, would not have been able to do that without the speed of 5G. So the speed of the data transfer can help you think about new situations and new ways of uh, delivering insight and cognitive using uh, the edge. So that's what I wanted to present. I hope uh, it's been uh, useful and now I'm happy to answer questions.